Section 10 of Heart A Schoolboy's Journal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Heart A Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo Diamichis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. February. A medal well bestowed. Saturday, the 4th. This morning, the superintendent of the schools, a gentleman with a white beard and dressed in black, came to present the medals. He came in with the principal a little before the close and seated himself beside the teacher. He questioned a few, then gave the first medal to Darasi, and before giving the second, he stood for a few moments, listening to the teacher and the principal, who were talking to him in a low voice. All were asking themselves, to whom will he give the second? The superintendent said aloud, Pupil Pedro Procasi has merited the second medal this week, merited it by his work at home, by his lessons, by his handwriting, by his conduct in every way. All turned to look at Procasi and seemed pleased. Procasi rose in such confusion that he did not know where he was. Come here, said the superintendent. Procasi sprang up from his seat and went to the master's table. The superintendent looked attentively at the little waxen face, at the puny body enveloped in turned and ill-fitting garments, at the kind, sad eyes which avoided his, but which hinted at a story of suffering. Then he said to him, in a voice full of affection, as he fastened the medal on his shoulder, I give you the medal, Procasi. No one is more worthy to wear it than you. I bestow it not only on your intelligence and your good will. I bestow it on your heart. I give it to your courage, to your character of a brave and good son. Is it not true, he added, turning to the class, that he deserves it also on that score? Yes, yes, all answered with one voice. Procasi made a movement of the throat as though he were swallowing something, and cast upon the benches a very sweet look which bespoke his immense gratitude. Go, my dear boy, said the superintendent, and may God protect you. It was the hour for dismissing the school. Our class got out before the others. As soon as we were outside the door, whom should we espy there in the large hall just at the entrance? The father of Procasi, the blacksmith pale as usual, with fierce face, hair hanging over his eyes, his cap awry and unsteady on his legs. The teacher caught sight of him instantly and whispered to the superintendent. The latter sought out Procasi in haste, and taking him by the hand, he led him to his father. The boy was trembling. He and the superintendent approached. Several of the boys collected around them. Is it true that you are the father of this lad? asked the superintendent of the blacksmith with a cheerful air as though they were friends and without awaiting a reply i rejoice with you look he has won the second medal over fifty-four of his comrades he has deserved it by his composition his arithmetic everything he is a boy of great intelligence and good will who will accomplish great things a noble lad who has gained the friendship and esteem of all you may feel proud of him i assure you the blacksmith, who had stood there with open mouth listening to him, stared at the superintendent and the principal, and then at his son, who was standing before him with downcast eyes and trembling. And as though he had remembered and comprehended then, for the first time, all that he had made the little boy suffer, and all the goodness, the heroic constancy, with which the latter had borne it, his face took on a certain stupid wonder, then a sullen remorse and finally a sad, fierce tenderness. And with a quick movement, he caught the boy around the head and strained him to his breast. We went out ahead of them. I invited him to come to the house on Thursday with Coroni and Crassi. Others bowed to him. One gave him a friendly pat. Another touched his medal. All said something to him. And his father stared at us in amazement as he still had his son's head pressed to his breast while the boy sobbed. 
Good Resolutions, Sunday the 5th. The medal given to Procasi had awakened a regret in me. I have never earned one yet. For some time past, I have not been studying, and I am discontented with myself. And the teacher and my father and mother are discontented with me. I no longer take delight in amusing myself as I did formerly, when I worked with the will and then sprang up from the table and ran to my games full of joy, as though I had not played for a month. Neither do I sit down to the table with my family with the same contentment as of old. I have always a shadow in my soul, an inward voice that says to me continually, It won't do. It won't do. In the evening, a great many boys pass through the square on the return from work. In the midst of the group of working men, weary but merry, they step briskly along, impatient to reach their homes and suppers, and they talk loudly, laughing and slapping each other on the shoulder with hands blackened with coal or whitened with plaster. And I reflect that they have been working since daybreak up to this hour. And with them are also many others who are still smaller, who have been standing all day on the summits of roofs, in front of ovens, among machines, and in the water, and underground, with nothing to eat but a little bread. And I feel almost ashamed that I, in all that time, have accomplished nothing but scribble four small pages, and that reluctantly. Ah, I am discontented, discontented. I see plainly that my father is out of humor, and would like to tell me so. But he is sorry, and he is still waiting. My dear father, who works so hard, all is yours, all that I see around me in the house, all that I touch, all that I wear and eat, all that teaches me or amuses me, all is the fruit of your toil, and I do not work. All has cost you thought, privations, trouble, effort, and I make no effort. Ah, no, this is too unjust, and it causes me too much pain. I will begin this very day. I will apply myself to my studies, like Stardi, with clenched fist and set teeth. I will set about it with all the strength of my will and my heart. I will conquer my drowsiness in the evening. I will come down promptly in the morning. I will cudgel my brains without ceasing. I will punish my laziness without mercy. I will toil, suffer, even to the extent of making myself ill. But I will put a stop once for all to this aimless life, which is degrading me and causing sorrow to others. Courage to work, to work with all my soul and all my nerves, to work which will restore to me sweet rest, pleasing games, cheerful meals, to work which will give me back again the kindly smile of my teacher, the blessed kiss of my father. The Train of Cars, Friday the 10th. Fercasi came to our house today with Goroni. I do not think that two sons of princes would have been received with greater delight. This is the first time that Goroni had been here, because he is rather shy. And then he is ashamed to show himself because he is so large, and is still in the third grade. We all went to open the door when they rang. Carasi did not come because his father has at last arrived from America, after an absence of seven years. My mother kissed Procasi. My father introduced Goroni to her, saying, Here is a lad who is not only a good boy, he is a man of honor and a gentleman. And the boy dropped his big, shaggy head with a sly smile at me. Procasi had on his meadow, and he was happy, because his father had gone to work again and has not drunk anything for the last five days. Wants him to be always in the workshop to keep him company, and seems quite another man. We began to play, and I brought out all of my things. Prakasi was delighted with my train of cars, and the engine that goes of itself on being wound up. He had never seen anything of the kind. He devoured the little red and yellow cars with his eyes. I gave him the key, and he knelt down to play with the train, and did not so much as raise his head again. I have never seen him so happy. He kept saying, Excuse me, excuse me and motioning to us with his hands, not to stop the engine, 
and then he picked it up and started the cars with as much care as though they had been made of glass. He was afraid of tarnishing them with his breath, and he polished them up again, looking them over, top and bottom, and smiling to himself. We stood around him and gazed at him. We looked at the slender neck, the poor little ears, which I had seen bleeding one day, the jacket with the sleeves turned up, and two sickly little arms, which had been upraised to ward off blows from his face. Oh, at that moment I could have cast all my playthings and all my books at his feet. I could have taken the last morsel of bread from my lips to give to him. I could have taken off my clothing to clothe him. I could have flung myself on my knees to kiss his hand. I shall at least give you the train, I thought, but at first I must ask my father. At that moment I felt a bit of paper thrust into my hand. I looked. It was written in pencil by my father. It said, Your train strikes Bracassi's fancy. He has no playthings. Does your heart suggest nothing to you? Instantly I seized the engine and the cars in both hands, and I placed them in his arms, saying, Take this. It is yours. He looked at me and did not understand. It is yours, I said. I give it to you. Then he looked at my father and mother in still greater astonishment, and asked me, But why? My father replied, Irico gives it to you because he is your friend, because he loves you to celebrate your medal. Percasi asked timidly, I may carry it away home? Of course, we all responded. He was already at the door, but he dared not go out. He was happy. He begged our pardon with a mouth that smiled and quivered. Godoni helped him to wrap up the train in a handkerchief, and as he bent over, he made the things with which his pockets were filled rattle. Pride. Some day, said Fracassi to me, you shall come to the shop to see my father at work. I will give you some nails. My mother put a little bunch of flowers into Godoni's buttonhole for him to carry to his mother in her name. Godoni said thank you in his big voice without raising his chin from his breast, but all his kind and noble soul shone in his eyes. Pride, Saturday, Nunt. The idea of Carlo Nobis rubbing off his sleeve affectedly when Procasso touches him in passing. That fellow is pride personified because his father is a rich man. But Dorosi's father is rich too. Nobis would like to have a bench to himself. He is afraid that the rest will soil it. He looks down on everyone and always has a scornful smile on his lips. Woe to him who stumbles over his foot when we go out in files two by two. For a mere trifle, he flings an insulting word in your face or a threat to get his father to come to the school. It is true that his father did give him a good lesson when he called the little son of a charcoal man a ragamuffin. I have never seen so disagreeable a schoolboy. No one speaks to him, no one says goodbye to him when he goes out, and there is not even a dog who would prompt him when he does not know his lesson. He cannot endure anyone, and he pretends to despise Dorosi more than all, because he is the head boy, and Garoni because he is beloved by all. But Dorosi pays no attention to him when he is by, and when the boys tell Garoni that Nobis has been speaking ill of him, he says, his pride is so silly that it is not worth fighting about. But Coretti said to him one day, when Nobis was smiling disdainfully at his cat skin cap, Go to Dorosi for a while and learn how to play the gentleman. Yesterday he complained to the teacher because Calabrian touched his leg with his foot. The teacher asked Calabrian, Did you do it intentionally? No, sir, he replied, frankly. You are too petulant, Nobis, said the teacher, and Nobis retorted in his airy array. I shall tell my father about it. Then the teacher got angry. Your father will tell you that you are in the wrong, as he had on other occasions. And besides that, it is the teacher alone who has the right to judge and punish in school. Then he added pleasantly, Come, Nobis, change your ways. Be kind and courteous to your comrades. You see, we have here sons of working men and of gentlemen, of the rich and the poor, and all love each other and treat each other like brothers, as they are. 
why do not you do like the rest? It would not cost you much to make everyone like you, and you would be so much happier yourself, too. Well, have you no reply to make me? No beast who had listened to him with his customary scornful smile answered coldly, No, sir. The Wounds of Labor Sit down, said the master to him. I am sorry for you. You are a boy without a heart. This seemed to be the end of it all. But the little mason who sits on the front bench turned his round face toward Nobis, who sits on the back bench, and made such a fine and ridiculous hare's face at him that the whole class burst into a shout of laughter. The master reproved him, but he was obliged to put his hand over his own mouth to hide a smile. And even Nobis laughed, but not in a pleasant way. Monday, 15th. No beast can be paired off with Franti. Neither of them was affected this morning by the terrible sight which passed before our eyes. On coming out of school, I was standing with my father and looking at some big boys of the second grade who had thrown themselves on their knees and were wiping off the ice with their cloaks and caps in order to make slides more quickly. When we saw a crowd of people appear at the end of the street, walking hurriedly, all serious and seemingly terrified, and talking in low tones. In the midst of them were three policemen, and behind the policemen two men, carrying a litter. Boys hastened up from all quarters. The crowd advanced toward us. On the litter was stretched a man, pale as a corpse, with his head resting on one shoulder, and his hair tumbled and stained with blood, for he had been losing blood through the mouth and ears and beside the litter walked a woman with a baby in her arms, who seemed crazy and who shrieked from time to time, Is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? Behind the woman came a boy who had a satchel under his arm and who was sobbing. What has happened? asked my father. A neighbor replied that the man was a mason who had fallen from the fourth story while at work. The bearers of the litter halted for a moment. Many turned away their faces in horror. I saw the schoolmaster of the red feather supporting my mistress of the upper first, who was almost in a swoon. At the same moment I felt a touch on the elbow. It was the little mason, who was ghastly white and trembling from head to foot. He was certainly thinking of his father. I was thinking of him too, and I at least am at peace in my mind while at school. I know that my father is at home, seated at his table, far removed from all danger. But how many of my companions think that their fathers are at work on the very high bridge, are close to the wheels of a machine, and that a movement, a single false step, may cost them their lives? They are like so many sons of soldiers who gave fathers in the battle. Moro Torino gazed and gazed and trembled more and more, and my father noticed it and said, Go home, my boy. Go at once to your father, and you will find him safe and sound. Go. The little mason went off, turning around at every step, and in the meanwhile the crowd had begun to move again, and the woman to shriek in a way that rent the heart, He is dead! He is dead! He is dead! No, no, he is not dead, people on all sides said to her, but she paid no heed to them and tore her hair. Then I heard an indignant voice say, You are laughing? and at the same moment I saw a bearded man staring in Franti's smiling face. Then the man knocked Franti's cap to the ground with his stick, saying, Uncover your head, you wicked boy, when a man wounded by labor is passing by. The crowd had already passed, and a long streak of blood was to be seen in the middle of the street. The Prisoner, Friday, 17th. Ah, uh, this is certainly the strangest event of the whole year. Yesterday morning, my father took me to the suburbs of Moncalari to look at a villa which he thought of hiring for the coming summer. Because we shall not go to Chauri again this year, and it turned out that the person who had the keys was a teacher who acts as secretary to the owner. He showed us the house, and then he took us to his own room, where he gave us something to drink. On his table, among the glasses, there was a wooden inkstand, of a conical form, carved in a singular manner. 
Noting that my father was looking at it, the teacher said, That inkstand is very precious to me, if you only knew its history, sir. And he told it. Years ago, he was a teacher at Turin, and all one winter went daily to give lessons to the prisoners in a judicial prison. He gave the lessons in the chapel of the jail, which is a circular building, and all around it, on the high bare walls, are a great many little square windows, covered with two crossbars of iron, each one of which corresponds to a small cell inside. He gave his lessons, as he paced about the dark, cold chapel, and his scholars stood at the holes with their copy-books resting against the gratings, showing nothing in the shadow but wan, frowning faces, gray and ragged beards, staring eyes of murderers and thieves. Among the rest there was one, number 78, who was more attentive than all the others, and who studied a great deal, and gazed at his teacher with eyes full of respect and gratitude. He was a young man, with a black beard, more unfortunate than wicked, a cabinet-maker who, in a fit of rage, had flung a plane at his master, who had been persecuting him for some time, and had inflicted a mortal wound on his head. For this he had been condemned to several years of imprisonment. In three months he had learned to read and write, and he read constantly, and the more he learned, the better he seemed to become, and the more remorseful for his crime. One day, at the conclusion of a lesson, he made a sign to the teacher to come nearer to his little window, and told him that he was to leave Turin on the following day, to go and expiate his crime in the prison at Venice. As he bade him farewell, he begged in a humble and much-moved voice that he might be allowed to touch the teacher's hand. The teacher offered him his hand, and he kissed it. Then he said, Thanks, thanks, and disappeared. The master drew back his hand. It was bathed with tears. After that, he did not see the man again. Six years passed. I was thinking of anything except that unfortunate man, said the teacher, when, the other morning, I saw a stranger come to the house, a man with a large black beard already sprinkled with gray and badly dressed, who said to me, Are you the teacher so-and-so, sir? Who are you? I asked him. I am prisoner number 78, he replied. You taught me to read and write six years ago, if you recollect. You gave me your hand at the last lesson. I have now expiated my crime, and I have come to beg you to do me the favor of accepting a memento of me, a poor little thing which I made in prison. Will you accept it in memory of me, Signor Master? I stood there speechless. He thought that I did not wish to take it, and he looked at me as much to say, So six years of suffering are not sufficient to cleanse my hands? But he gazed at me with so much pain that I instantly extended my hand and took the little object. This is it? We looked closely at the inkstand. It seemed to have been carved very laboriously with the point of a nail. On its top was graven a pen lying across a copy book and around it was written, To my teacher, a memento of number 78, six years, three, and below, in small letters, study and hope. The teacher said nothing more. We went away. But all the way from Montcalari to Turin, I could not get that prisoner, standing at his little window, that farewell to his master that poor inkstand made in prison, which told so much, out of my head. And I dreamed of them all night, and was still thinking of them this morning, far enough from imagining the surprise which awaited me at school. No sooner had I taken my new seat beside Darasi and written my problem in arithmetic for the monthly examination, than I told my companion the story of the prisoner in the inkstand, and how the inkstand was made, with the pen across the copy-book and the inscription around it, six years. Durasi sprang up at these words and began to look first at me and then at Karasi, the son of the vegetable vendor, who sat on the bench in front, with his back turned to us, wholly absorbed on his problem. Hush, he said then, in a low voice, catching me by the arm. Don't you know that Karasi spoke to me 
day before yesterday, of having caught a glimpse of an inkstand in the hands of his father, who had returned from America, a conical inkstand made by hand with a copybook and a pen. That is the one. Six years. He said that his father was in America. Instead of that, he was in prison. Carassi was a little boy at the time of the crime. He does not remember it. His mother has deceived him. He knows nothing. Let not a syllable of this escape. I remained speechless, with my eyes fixed on Carassi. Then Dorassi solved his problem and passed it under the bench to Carassi. He gave him a sheet of paper. The boy had walked ten miles. Daddy's nurse. He took out of his hand the monthly story, Daddy's nurse, which the teacher had given him to copy out, in order that he might copy it for him. He gave him pins and stroked his shoulder and made me promise on my honor that I would say nothing to anyone. And when we left school, he said to me hastily, His father came to get him yesterday. He will be here again this morning. Do as I do. To the street, Crossy's father was there, a little to one side. A man with a black beard sprinkled with gray, badly dressed, and with a colorless, thoughtful face. Dorasi shook Crossy's hand in a way to attract attention and said to him in a loud tone, Farewell, until we meet again, Karasi, and passed his hand under his chin. I did the same, but as he did so, Darasi turned crimson, and so did I, and Karasi's father gazed straight at us with a kindly glance, but through it shone a look of distrust and doubt, which made our hearts grow cold. End of section 10 Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Section 11 of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo Diamichis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Section 11. Chapter February Daddy's Nurse Monthly Story One morning, on a rainy day in March, a lad dressed like a country boy, all wet and muddy, with a bundle of clothes under his arm, came up to the porter of the great hospital at Naples, and presenting a letter, asked for his father. He had a fine oval face of a pale brown hue, thoughtful eyes and two thick lips, always half open, which displayed extremely white teeth. He came from a village in the neighborhood of Naples. His father, who had left home a year previously to seek work in France, had returned to Italy and had landed a few days before at Naples, where, having fallen suddenly ill, he had hardly time to write a line to announce his arrival to his family and to say he was going to the hospital. His wife, in despair at this news and unable to leave home because she had a sick child and a baby to attend, had sent her eldest son to Naples with a few soldi, to help his father, his daddy, as they called him. The boy had walked ten miles. The porter, after glancing at the letter, called a nurse and told him to conduct the lad to his father. Whose father? inquired the nurse. The boy, trembling with terror, lest he should hear bad news, gave the name. The nurse did not recall such a name. An old laborer arrived from abroad, he asked. Yes, a laborer replied the lad, still more uneasy. Not so very old. Yes, arrived from abroad. When did he enter the hospital? asked the nurse. The boy glanced at his letter. Five days ago, I think. The nurse stood a while in thought, then as though suddenly recalling him. Ah, he said, the furthest bed in the fourth ward. Is he very ill? How is he? inquired the boy anxiously. The nurse looked at him without replying. Then he said, Come with me. They ascended two flights of stairs, walked to the end of a long corridor, and found themselves facing the open door of a large hall, wherein two rows of beds were arranged. Come, replied the nurse, entering. The boy plucked up his courage and followed him. 
casting terrified glances to right and left on the pale, emancipated faces of the sick people, some of whom had their eyes closed and seemed to be dead, while others were staring into the air with their eyes wide open and fixed, as though frightened. Some were moaning like children. The big room was dark. The air was filled with an acute odor of medicines. Two sisters of charity were going about with files in their hands. Arrived at the end of the great room, the nurse halted at the head of the bed, drew aside the curtains, and said, Here is your father. The boy burst into tears, and letting fall his bundle, he dropped his head on the sick man's shoulder, clasping with one hand the arm which was laying motionless on the coverlet. The sick man did not move. The boy rose to his feet and looked at his father, and broke into a fresh fit of weeping. Then the sick man gave a long look at him, and seemed to recognize him, but his lips did not move. Poor Daddy, how he has changed! The son would never have recognized him. His hair had turned white, his beard had grown, his face was swollen, of a dull red hue, with the skin tightly drawn and shining. His eyes were diminished in size, his lips were very thick, and his whole countenance was altered. There was no longer anything natural about him, but his forehead and the arch of his eyebrows. He breathed with difficulty. Hey, Daddy, said the boy, it is I. Don't you know me? I am Chichila, your own Chichila, who has come from the country. Mama has sent me. Take a good look at me. Don't you know me? Say one word to me. But the sick man, after having looked at him, closed his eyes. Daddy, Daddy, what is the matter with you? I am your little son, your own... Chichilo. The sick man did not stir and continued to breathe painfully. Then the lad, still weeping, took a chair, seated himself and waited, without taking his eyes from his father's face. A doctor will surely come to pay him a visit, he thought. He will tell me something. And he gave himself up to the sad thoughts, recalling many things about his kind father. The day of parting when he had said the last goodbye to him on board the ship, the hopes which his family had founded on his journey, anguish of his mother on the arrival of the letter. Then he thought of death. He beheld his father dead, his mother dressed in black, the family in misery. He remained a long time thus. A light hand touched him on the shoulder, and he started up. It was a nun. "'What is the matter with my father?' he asked her quickly. "'Is he your father?' asked the sister gently. "'Yes, he is my father. I have come.' What ails him? Courage, my boy, replied the sister. The doctor will be here soon now. And she went away without saying anything more. Half an hour later, he heard the sound of a bell, and he saw the doctor enter at the further end of the hall, accompanied by an assistant. The sister and a nurse followed him. They began the visit, pausing at every bed. This time of waiting seemed an eternity to the lad and his anxiety increased at every step of the doctor. At length they arrived at the next bed. The doctor was an old man, tall and stooping, with a grave face. Before he left the next bed, the boy rose to his feet, and when he approached, he began to cry. The doctor looked at him. He is the sick man's son, said the sister. He arrived this morning from the country. The doctor placed one hand on his shoulder, then he bent over the sick man felt his pulse, touched his forehead, and asked a few questions of the sister, who replied, There is nothing new. Then he thought for a while and said, Continue the present treatment. Then the boy took courage and asked in a tearful voice, What is the matter with my father? Be brave, my boy, replied the doctor, laying his hand on his shoulder once more. He has erysipelas of the face. It is a serious case. But there is still hope. Help him. Your presence may do him a great deal of good. But he does not know me, exclaimed the boy in a mournful tone. He will recognize you tomorrow, perhaps. Let us hope for the best and keep up our courage. The boy would have liked to ask some more questions, but he did not dare. The doctor passed on, and then he began his life of nurse. As he could do nothing else, he arranged the coverlets of the sick man touched his hand every now and then, drove away the flies, bent over him at every groan. The sister brought him something to drink. He took the glass or the spoon from her hand and gave it in her stead. The sick man looked at him occasionally, 
but he gave no sign of recognition. However, his glance rested longer on the boy each time, especially when the latter put his handkerchief to his eyes. Thus passed the first day. At night the boy slept on two chairs in a corner of the ward, and in the morning he resumed his work of mercy. That day it seemed as though the eyes of the sick man revealed a dawning of consciousness. At the sound of the boy's soothing voice a vague expression of gratitude seemed to gleam for an instant in his pupils, and once he moved his lips a little, as though he wanted to say something. After each brief nap he seemed, on opening his eyes, to seek his little nurse. The doctor who had passed twice thought he noted a slight improvement. Towards evening, on putting the cup to his lips, the lad fancied that he saw a very faint smile glide across the swollen lips. Then he began to take comfort and to hope, and with the hope of being understood, confusingly at least, he talked to him, talked to him at great length of his mother, of his little sisters, of his own return home, and he exhorted him to courage with warm and loving words, and although he often doubted whether he was heard, he still talked. For it seemed to him that even if he did not understand him, the sick man listened with a certain pleasure to his voice to that unaccustomed intonation of affection and sorrow. Thus passed the second day, and the third, and the fourth, with slight improvements or unexpected changes for the worst, and the boy was so absorbed in all his cares that he hardly nibbled a bit of bread or in cheese twice a day when the sister brought it to him, and hardly saw what was going on around him, the dying patients, the sudden running up of the sisters at the night, the moaning and despairing gestures of the visitors, all those doleful scenes of hospital life, which on any other occasion would have shocked and alarmed him. Days passed, and still he was there with his daddy, watchful, wistful, trembling at every sigh and at every look, shaken continually between a hope which relieved his mind and a discouragement which froze his heart. On the fifth day, the sick man suddenly grew worse. The doctor, on being questioned, shook his head, as much as to say that all was over, and the boy flung himself on the chair and burst out sobbing. But one thing comforted him. In spite of the fact that he was worse, the sick man seemed to be slowly regaining a little consciousness. He stared at the lad with increasing attention, and with an expression which grew in sweetness, would take his drink and medicine from no one but him and made strenuous efforts with his lips with greater frequency, as though he were trying to pronounce some word. He did it so plainfully sometimes that his son grasped his arm violently, inspired by a sudden hope, and said to him, in a tone which was almost that of a joy, Courage, courage, Daddy, you will get well. We will go away from here. We will go home to Mama. Courage for a little while longer. It was four o'clock in the afternoon, and just as the boy had abandoned himself to one of these outbursts of tenderness and hope, that a sound of footsteps was heard outside the nearest door in the ward, and then a strong voice uttering two words only, Farewell, sister, which made him spring to his feet, with a stifled cry in his throat. At that moment a man with a bundle in his hand entered the ward, followed by a sister. The boy uttered a sharp cry and stood rooted to the spot. The man turned around, looked at him for a moment, and cried in his turn, Chichilo, and darted towards him. The boy fell into his father's arms, choking with emotion. The sister, the nurse, and the assistant ran up, and stood there in amazement. The boy could not recover his voice. Oh, my Chichilo, exclaimed the father, after casting a searching glance on the sick man, as he kissed the boy repeatedly. Chichilo, my son, how is this? They took you to the bedside of another man, and there was I, in despair at not seeing you after Mamma had written. I have sent him. Poor Chichilo, how many days have you been here? How did this mistake occur? I have come out of it easily. I have a good constitution, you know. And how is Mamma, and Conchitella, and the little baby? How are they all? I am leaving the hospital now. Come then, oh, good heavens, who would have thought it? The boy tried to say a few words, to tell the news of the family. Oh, how happy I am, he stammered. How happy I am. What terrible days I have passed. And he could not finish kissing his father. But he did not stir. Come, said his father, we can get home this evening. And he drew the lad towards him. 
the boy turned to look at his patient. Well, are you coming or not? his father asked in amazement. The boy gave still another look at the sick man, who opened his eyes at that moment and gazed intently at him. Then a flood of words poured from his very soul. No, Daddy, wait here. I can't. Here is this old man. I have been here for five days. He watches me all the time. I thought he was you. I love him dearly. He looks at me. I give him his drink. He wants me always beside him. He is very ill now. Have patience. I have not the courage. I don't know it pains me too much. I will go tomorrow. Let me stay here a little longer. I don't at all like to leave him. See how he looks at me? I don't know who he is, but he wants me. He will die alone. Let me stay here, dear Daddy. Bravo, little fellow, exclaimed the attendant. The father stood in perplexity, staring at the boy. Then he looked at the sick man. Who is he? he inquired. A countryman like yourself, replied the attendant, just arrived from abroad, and who entered the hospital on the very day you did. He was out of his senses when they brought him here and could not speak. Perhaps he has a family far away and sons. He probably thinks that your son is one of his. The sick man was still looking at the boy. The father said to Chichilo, stay. He would not have to stay much longer, murmured the attendant. Stay, repeated his father. You have a heart. I will go home at once to relieve Mama's distress. Here is a scudo for your expenses. Goodbye, my brave little son, until we meet. He embraced him, looked at him fixedly, kissed him again on the brow, and went away. The boy went back to his post at the bedside, and the sick man appeared consoled and Cicillo began again to play the nurse, no longer weeping, but with the same eagerness, the same patience, as before. He again began to give the man his drink, to arrange his bedclothes, to caress his hand, to speak softly to him, to exhort him to courage. He attended him all that day, all that night. He remained beside him all the following day. But the sick man continued to grow constantly worse. His face turned a purple color. His breathing grew heavier. He grew more restless. Articulate cries escaped his lips. The swelling began greater. On his evening visit, the doctor said that he would not live to the night. And then Cicillo doubled his cares and never took his eyes from him for a minute. The sick man gazed and gazed at him and kept moving his lips from time to time with great effort as though he wanted to say something. An expression of extraordinary tenderness passed over his eyes now and then, as they continued to grow smaller and more dim. And that night the boy watched with him until he saw the first rays of dawn gleam white through the windows, and the sister appeared. The sister approached the bed, cast a glance at the patient, and went away with rapid steps. A few moments later she had reappeared with the assistant doctor and with the nurse who carried a lantern. He is at his last gasp, said the doctor. The boy clasped the sick man's hand. The latter opened his eyes, gazed at him, and closed them once more. At that moment the boy fancied that he felt a pressure of the hand. He pressed my hand, he exclaimed. The doctor bent over the patient for an instant, then straightened himself up. The sister took the crucifix from the wall. He is dead, cried the boy. Go, my son, said the doctor. Your work of mercy is finished. Go, and may fortune attend you, for you deserve it. God will protect you. Farewell. The sister, who had stepped aside for a moment, returned with a little bunch of violets, which she had taken from a glass on the window sill, and handed them to the boy, saying, I have nothing else to give you. Take these in memory of the hospital. I thank you, said the boy, taking the bunch of flowers with one hand and drying his eyes with the other. But I have such a long distance to go on foot, I shall spoil them. And he loosened the violets. He scattered them over the bed, saying, I leave them in re remembrance of my poor dead man. Thank you, sister. Thank you, doctor. Then turning to the dead man, farewell. And while he sought a name to give him, the sweet name which he had applied to him for five days recurred to his lips. Farewell, poor daddy.
So saying, he took his little bundle of clothes under his arm, and with slow, weary steps, he walked away. The day was dawning. The Workshop, Saturday, 18th. Precossi came last night to remind me that I was to go and see his workshop, which is down the street. So this morning, when I went out with my father, I got him to take me there for a moment. As we neared the shop, Gerolfri issued from it on the run with a package in his hand, his big cloak, with which he hides his merchandise, fluttering in the wind. Ah, now I know where he goes to get the iron filings, which he sells for old papers. That traitor of a Gerolfri. When we came to the door, we saw Percasi seated on a little pile of bricks, studying his lesson with his book resting on his knees. He rose quickly and invited us to enter. It was a large room, full of coal dust, bristling with hammers, pinchers, bars, and old iron of every description, and in one corner burned a fire in a small furnace, where puffed a pair of bellows worked by a boy. The father was standing near the anvil, and a young man was holding a bar of iron in the fire. "'Ah, there he is,' said the smith, as soon as he caught sight of us, and he lifted his cap. "'The nice boy who gives away railroad trains. He has come to see me work a little, has he not? I shall be at your service in a moment.' And as he said it, he smiled, and he no longer had the salvaged face, the evil eyes of former days. The young man handed him a long bar of iron heated red-hot on one end and the smith placed it on the anvil. He was making one of those curved bars for the rail of Terra's balustrades. He raised a large hammer and began to beat the bar, pushing the heated part out here, now there, between one point of the anvil and the middle, and turning it about in various ways. And it was a marvel to see how the iron curved beneath the rapid and accurate blows of the hammer, and twisted and gradually assumed the graceful form of a leaf torn from a flower shaped as though it were of dough which he had modelled with his hands and meanwhile his son watched us with a certain air of pride as much as to say see how my father works do you see how it is done little master the blacksmith asked me when he had finished holding out the bar which looked like a bishop's crozier then he laid it aside and thrust another one into the fire that was very well made indeed, my father said to him, and he added, So you are working, huh? You have returned to good habits. Yes, I have returned, replied the workman, wiping away the perspiration and reddening a little. Do you know who made me return to them? My father pretended not to understand. This brave boy, said the blacksmith, indicating his son with his finger, the boy who studied and did honor to his father, while his father rioted and treated him like a dog. When I saw that medal, ah, though, little lad of mine, no bigger than a soto of cheese, come here, that I may get a good look at you. The boy ran to him instantly. The smith took him and put him on the anvil, holding him under the arms, and said to him, Scrub up the front of this big beast of a daddy of yours a little. And then Fricossi covered his father's black face with kisses until he was all black himself. That's the way to do it, said the smith, and he set him on the ground again. That really is the way, Precossi, exclaimed my father, delighted, and bidding the smith and his son good day, he led me away. As I was going out, little Precossi said to me, Excuse me, and thrust a packet of nails into my pocket. I invited him to come and view the carnival from my house. You gave him your railroad train, my father said to me in the street. But if it had been made of gold and filled with pearls, it would still have been but a petty gift to that sainted son who has reformed his father's heart. The Little Clown, Monday, 20th. The whole city is in a tumult over the carnival, which is nearing its close. In every square rise booths of mountebanks and jesters, and we have under our windows a circus tent in which a little Venetian company with five horses is giving a show. The circus is in the center of the square, and in one corner there are three very large vans, in which the mountebanks sleep and dress themselves. Three small houses on wheels with their tiny windows and a chimney in each of them, which smokes continually, and between window and window the babies' swaddling bands are stretched. 
there is one woman who nurses a child, prepares the food, and dances on the tightrope. Poor people! The word mountebank is spoken as though it were an insult, but they earn their living honestly, nevertheless by amusing all the world, and how they work. All day long they run back and forth between the circus tent and the vans and tights, in all this cold. They snatch a mouthful or two in haste, standing between two performances. And sometimes, when they get their tent full, a wind arises, wrenching away the ropes, and puts out the lights, and then goodbye to the show. They are obliged to return the money, and to work the entire night, at repair in their booth. There are two lads who work, and my father recognized the smallest one as he was going across the square. He is the son of a proprietor, the same one we saw perform tricks on horseback last year in a circus on the Piazza Vittoria Emanuel, and he has grown. He must be eight years old. He is a handsome boy with a round and roughish face and with so many black curls that they escape from his pointed hat. He is dressed up like a clown, decked out in a sort of sack with sleeves of white embroidered with black, and his slippers are of cloth. He is a merry little imp. He charms everyone. He does everything. We see him early in the morning, wrapped in a shawl, carrying milk to his wooden house. Then he goes to get the horses at the stable on the Via Vitola. He holds the tiny baby in his arms. He carries hoops, trestles, rails, ropes. He cleans the vans, lights the fire, and in his leisure moments he always hangs about his mother. My father is always watching him from the window and does nothing but talk about him and his family, who have the air of nice people and of being fond of their children. One evening we went to the circus. It was cold, and there was hardly anyone there, but the little clown did his best to keep the crowd merry. He made risky leaps. He caught hold of the horse's tail. He walked all alone with his legs in the air. He sang, always with a smile on his handsome little brown face, and his father, who had on a red vest and white trousers, with tall boots, and a whip in his hand, watched him. It was really pitiful. My father was sorry for him, and spoke of him on the following days to Delis, the painter, who came to see us. These poor people were killing themselves with hard work, and their affairs were going so badly. The little boy pleased him so much. What could be done for them? The artist had an idea. What a fine article for the Gazette, he said. You know how to write well. Tell the wonderful things which the little clown does, and I will draw his portrait for you. Everybody reads the Gazette, and people will flock to see the circus. They did so. My father wrote a good article, full of jest, which told all that we had seen from the window, and made people want to see it and pet the little artist. And the painter sketched a little portrait which was graceful and good likeness, and which was published on Saturday evening. And behold, at the Sunday performance, a great crowd rushed to the circus. The announcement was made, Benefit that performance for the little clown, as he was styled in the Gazette. The circus was crammed. Many of the spectators held the Gazette in their hands and showed it to the little clown, who laughed and ran from one to another, perfectly delighted. The proprietor was delighted also. Just fancy, not a single newspaper had ever done him such an honor, and the money box was filled. My father sat beside me. Among the spectators we found persons we knew. Near the entrance for the horses stood the teacher of gymnastics, the one who had been with Garibaldi, and opposite us, in the second row, was the little mason, with his small round face, seated beside his gigantic father, and no sooner did he catch sight of me than he made a hare's face at me. A little farther on I espied Garoffi, who was counting the spectators and calculating on his fingers, how much money the company had taken in. On one of the chairs in the first row, not far from us, there was also poor Rabati, the boy who saved the child from the omnibus, with his crutches between his knees, pressed close to the side of his father, the artillery captain, who kept one hand on his shoulder. The performance began. The little clown did wonders on his horse, on the trapeze, on the tightrope, and every time he jumped down, everyone clapped their hands, and many pulled his curls, then several others, rope dancers, jugglers, and riders, clad in tights and sparkling with silver, went through their acts. But when the boy was not performing, the audience seemed to grow weary. At a certain point I saw the teacher of gymnastics who held his post, 
at the entrance of the horses, whisper in the ear of the proprietor of the circus, and the latter instantly glanced about as though in search of someone. His glance rested on us. My father saw this and understood that the teacher had revealed that he was the author of the article, and in order to escape being thanked, he hastily retreated, saying to me, You may stay, Enrico. I will wait for you outside. After exchanging a few words with his father, the little clown went through still another trick. Erect upon a galloping horse, he appeared in four characters as a pilgrim, a sailor, a soldier, and an acrobat, and every time that he passed near me, he looked at me. When he dismounted, he began to make the tour of the circus with his clown's cap in hand, and every one threw soldi or sugar plums into it. I had two soldi already, but when he got in front of me, instead of offering his cap, he drew it back, gave me a look, and passed on. I was ill at ease. Why had he offered me that slight? The performance came to an end. The proprietor thanked the audience, and all the people rose also, and thronged the doors. I was confused by the crowd, and was on the point of going out, when I felt a touch on my hand. I turned round. It was the little clown with his tiny, brown face and his black curls, who was smiling at me. He had his hands full of sugar plums. Then I understood. Will you accept these sugar plums from the little clown? He said in his dialect. I nodded and took three or four. Then he added, please accept a kiss also. Give me two, I answered, and held up my face to him. He rubbed off his flowery face with his hand, put his arms round my neck, and planted two kisses on my cheek, saying, There, take one of them to your father. End of section 11 Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas Section 12 of Heart, A Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Heart, A Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo de Michis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Chapter February The Last Day of the Carnival Tuesday, 21st What a sad scene was that we witnessed today at the possession of the mask. It ended well, but it might have resulted in a great misfortune. In the San Carlo Square, all decorated with red, white, and yellow festoons, a vast multitude had assembled. Masks of every hue were flittering about, cars gilded and adorned in the shape of pavilions little theaters barks filled with clowns warriors cooks sailors and shepherdess there was such a confusion that one knew not where to look a tremendous clash of trumpets horns and cymbals tore the ears and the mask on the chariots drank and sang as they addressed the people in the streets and at the windows who retorted at the top of their lungs and hurled oranges and sugar plums at each other vigorously. Above the chariots and the thong, as far as the eye could reach, one could see banners fluttering, helmets gleaming, plumes waving, gigantic pasteboard heads moving, huge headdresses, enormous trumpets, fantastic arms, little drums, castanets, red caps, and bottles. All the world seemed to have gone mad. When our carriage entered the square, a magnificent chariot was driving in front of us, drawn by four horses, covered with trappings, embroidered in gold, and wreathed in artificial roses, upon which there were fourteen or fifteen gentlemen masquerading as noblemen at the court of France, each a glitter with silk and a huge white wig, a plumed hat, a small sword under the arm, and a tuff of ribbons and laces on the breast. They were very gorgeous. They were singing a French song and throwing sweetmeats to the people, and the latter clapped their hands and shouted. Suddenly, on our left, we saw a man lift a child of five or six above the heads of the crowd, a poor little creature, who wept piteously and flung her arms about as though in a fit. 
the man made his way to the gentleman's chariot one of the latter bent down and the other said aloud take this child she has lost her mother in the crowd hold her in your arms the mother may not be far off she will catch sight of her there is no other way the gentleman took the child in his arms all the rest stopped singing the child screamed and struggled the gentleman removed his mask the chariot continued to move slowly meanwhile as we were afterwards told at the opposite side of the square a poor woman half crazed with despair was forcing her way through the crowd by main force elbowing and shrieking maria 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 i have lost my little daughter she has been stolen from me they have suffocated my child and for a quarter of an hour she raved in this manner straying now a little way in this direction and then a little way in that crushed by the throng through which she strove to force her way all this time the gentleman on the car was holding the child pressed against the ribbons and laces on his breast looking over the square and trying to calm the poor creature who covered her face with her hands not knowing where she was and sobbed as though her heart would break the gentleman was touched it was evident that these screams went to his soul all the others offered the child oranges and sugar plums but she refused them all growing constantly more convulsive and frightened find her mother shouted the gentleman to the crowd seek her mother everyone turned to the right and the left but the mother was not to be found finally a few paces from the place where the via roma enters the square a woman was seen to rush towards the chariot i shall never forget that she no longer seemed a human creature her hair was streaming her face distorted her garments torn she hurled herself forward with a rattle in her throat no one knew whether to attribute it to joy anguish or rage and darted out her hands like two claws to snatch her child the chariot stopped here she is said the gentleman reaching out the child after kissing it and he placed her in her mother's arms who pressed her to her breast in a transport of feeling but one of the tiny hands rested a second longer in the hands of the gentleman and the latter pulling off of his right hand a gold ring set with a large diamond and slipping it with a rapid movement upon the finger of the little girl said take this it shall be your marriage dowry the mother stood rooted to the spot as though enchanted the crowd broke into applause the gentleman put on his mask again his companions resumed their song and the chariot started on again slowly amid a tempest of hand clapping and hurrahs and boys thursday twenty fourth the teacher is very ill and they have sent in his stead the master of the fourth grade who has been a teacher in the institute for the blind he is the oldest of all the instructors with hair so white that it looks like a wig made of cotton and he speaks in a peculiar manner as though he were chanting a mournful song but he does it well and he knows a great deal no sooner had he entered the schoolroom than catching sight of a boy with a bandage on his eye he approached the bench and asked him what was the matter take care of your eyes my boy he said to him and then darasi asked him is it true sir that you have been a teacher of the blind yes for several years he replied and darasi said in a low voice tell us something about it the teacher went and seated himself at his table Coretti said aloud the institute for the blind is in the via Nisa. you say blind blind said the teacher as you would say poor or ill or i know not what but do you fully realize the meaning of that word reflect a little blind never to see anything not to be able to distinguish day from night neither the sky nor the sun nor your parents nor anything of what is around you and which you touch to be sunk in endless darkness as though buried in the bowels of the earth make a little effort to close your eyes and to think of being obliged to remain forever thus you will suddenly be overwhelmed by a mental agony by terror it will seem to you impossible to resist 
that you must burst into a scream, that you must go mad or die. But poor boys, when you enter the Institute for the Blind for the first time, during their recreation hour, and hear them playing on violins and flutes, and talking loudly and laughing, running up and down the stairs at a rapid pace, and wandering freely through the halls and dormitories. You would never think them to be the unfortunates that they are. One must observe them closely. There are lads of sixteen or eighteen, robust and cheerful, who bear their blindness with a certain ease, almost with hardihood, but you understand from a certain proud, resentful expression of countenance that they must have suffered tremendously before they became resigned to this misfortune. There are others with sweet and pallid faces on which a profound resignation is visible, but they are sad, and one understands that they must still weep at times in secret. Ah, my sons, reflect that some of them have lost their sight in a few days, some after years of martyrdom and after terrible surgical operations, and that many were born so, born into a night that has no dawn for them, that they entered into the world as into an immense tomb, and that they do not know what the human face is like. Picture to yourself how they must have suffered, and how they must still suffer, when they think thus confusedly of the vast difference between themselves and those who see, and ask themselves, why this difference, if we are not to blame? I, who have spent many years among them, when I recall that class, all those eyes forever sealed, all those pupils without sight and without life, and then look at the rest of you, I cannot find it possible that you should not all be happy. Think of it. There are about 26,000 blind persons in Italy, 26,000 persons who do not see the light. Do you understand? An army which would take four hours to match past our windows. The teacher paused. Not a breath was heard in all the school. Dorasi asked if it were true that the blind have a finer sense of feeling than the rest of us. It is true, the teacher answered. All the other senses are finer in them because since they must replace, among them, that of sight, they are more and better exercised than they are in the case of those who see. In the morning, in the dormitory, one asks another, Is the sun shining? And the one who is the most alert in dressing runs into the yard and waves his hands in the air to find out whether there is any warmth from the sun perceptible. Then he comes to tell the good news. The sun is shining. From the voice of a person they obtain an idea of his height. We judge of a man's soul by his eyes, they by his voice. They remember intonations and accents for years. They know if there is more than one person in a room, even if only one speaks, and the rest remain motionless. They know by their touch whenever a spoon is more or less polished. Little girls distinguish dyed wool from that which is of natural color, as they walk two and two along the streets. They recognize nearly all the shops by their odors, even those in which we perceive no odor. They spin top, and by listening to its humming, they go straight to it and pick it up without any mistake. They trundle hoop, play at nine pins, jump the rope, build little houses of stones, pick violets as though they saw them, make mats and baskets, weaving together straw of various colors rapidly and well. To such a degree is their sense of touch skilled. The sense of touch is their sight. One of their greatest pleasures is to handle, to grasp, to guess the forms of things by feeling them, to see them when they are taken to the industrial museum, where they are allowed to handle whatever they please, and to observe with what eagerness they fling themselves on geometrical bodies, on little models of houses, on instruments with what joy they fill over and rub and turn everything about in their hands, in order to see how it is made. They call this seeing. Interrupted the teacher to inquire if it were true that blind boys learn to reckon better than others. The master replied, It is true. They learn to reckon and to write. 
They have books made on purpose for them, with raised characters. They pass their fingers over these, recognize the letters, and pronounce the words. They read rapidly, and you should see them blush, poor little things, when they make a mistake. And they write, too, without ink. They write on a thick, hard sort of paper, with a metal bodkin, which makes a great many little hollows grouped according to a special alphabet. These little punctures stand out in relief on the other side of the paper, so that, by turning the paper over and drawing their fingers across these projections, they can read what they have written, and also the writing of others, and thus they write compositions, and they write letters to each other. They write numbers in the same way, and they make calculations, and they calculate mentally with an incredible ease, since their minds are not diverted by the sight of surrounding objects as ours are. And you should see how passionately fond they are of reading, how attentive they are, how well they remember everything, how they talk among themselves, even the little ones, of things connected with history and language, as they sit four or five on the same bench, without turning to each other, and converse, the first with the third, the second with the fourth, in a loud voice and all together, without losing a single word. So acute and prompt is their hearing. And they attach more importance to the examinations than you do, I assure you, and they are fonder of their teachers. They recognize their teacher by his step and his odor. They perceive whether he is in a good or bad humor, whether he is well or ill, simply by the sound or a single word of his. They want the teacher to touch them when he encourages and praises them, and they feel of his hand and his arms in order to express their gratitude. They love each other, and they are good comrades to each other. In playtime, they are always together according to their habit. In the girls' school, for instance, they form into groups according to the instrument on which they play, violinist, pianist, flute players, and they never separate. When they have become attached to anyone, it is difficult for them to break it off. They take much comfort in friendship. They judge correctly among themselves. They have a clear and profound idea of good and evil. No one grows so enthusiastic as they over the story of a kind action or a grand deed. He inquired if they played well. They are ardently fond of music, replied the teacher. It is their delight. Music is their life. Little blind children, when they first enter the Institute, are capable of standing three hours perfectly motionless to listen to playing. They learn easily. They play with fire. When the teacher tells one of them that he has no talent for music, he feels very sorrowful, but he sets to studying desperately. Ah, if you could hear the music there, if you could see them when they are playing, with their heads thrown back, a smile on their lips, faces aflame, trembling with emotion, in ecstasies at listening to that harmony which replies to them, in the obscurity which envelopes them. You would feel what a divine constellation is music, and they shout for joy. They beam with happiness when a teacher says to them, You will become an artist. The one who is first in music, who succeeds the best on the violin or piano, is like a king to them. They love, they venerate him. If a quarrel arises between two of them, they go to him. If two friends fall out, it is he who reconciles them. The smallest pupils, whom he teaches to play, regard him as a father. Then all go to bid him good night before retiring to bed. And they talk constantly of music. They are finally in bed, late at night, wearied by study and work and half asleep, and still they are discussing, in low tones, operas, masters, instruments, and orchestras. It is so great a punishment for them to be deprived of the reading or lesson in music. It causes them such sorrow that one can hardly ever has the courage to punish them in that way. What light is to our eyes, music is to their hearts. Darasi asked if we could go to see them. Yes, replied the teacher, but you must not go there now. You shall go later on, when you are in a condition to appreciate the whole extent of this misfortune. 
and to feel all the compassion which it merits. It is a sad sight, my boys. You will sometimes see their boys seated in front of an open window, enjoying the fresh air, with immovable countenance, which seem to be gazing at the wide green expanse and the beautiful blue mountains your own eyes can see. And you remember that they see nothing, that they will never see anything of that vast loveliness. Your soul is oppressed, as though you had yourself become blind at that moment. And then there are those who were born blind, who, as they have never seen the world, do not complain, because they do not possess the image of anything, and who, therefore, arouse less sympathy. But there are lads who have been blind but a few months, who still recall everything, who fully understand all that they have lost. And these have, in addition, the grief of feeling their minds obscured. The dearest images grow a little more dim in their minds day by day, of feeling the persons whom they have loved the most die out of their memories. One of these boys said to me one day, with the inexpressible sadness, I should like to have my sight again only for a moment in order to see my mamma's face once more, for I no longer remember it. And when their mothers come to see them, the boys place their hands on their faces. They feel from brow to chin and to ears to see how they are made. They can hardly persuade themselves that they cannot see her. And they call her by name many times to beseech her that she will allow them, that she will make them see her just once. How many even hard-hearted men go away in tears? And when you go out, your case seems to you to be the exception and the power to see people, houses, and the sky a hardly deserved privilege. Oh, there is not one of you, I am sure, who on leaving would not feel disposed to deprive himself of the portion of his sight in order to bestow a gleam at least upon all those poor children for whom the sun has no light, for whom a mother has no face. THE SICK TEACHER SATURDAY, 25TH Yesterday afternoon, on coming out of school, I went to pay a visit to my sick teacher. He made himself ill by overworking. Five hours of teaching a day, then an hour of gymnastics, then two hours more of evening school, which is saying little sleep, getting his food by snatches, and working breathlessly from morning till night. He has ruined his health. That is what my mother says. My mother was waiting for me at the big door. I came out alone, and on the stairs I met the teacher with the black beard, Koati, the one who frightens everyone and punishes no one. He stared at me with wide open eyes and made his voice like that of a lion, in jest, but without laughing. I was still laughing when I pulled the bell on the fourth floor but I ceased very suddenly when the servant let me into a wretched, half-lighted room where my teacher was lying. He was in a little iron bed. His beard was long. He put one hand to his brow in order to see better, and exclaimed in his affectionate voice, Enrico, I came to the bed. He laid one hand on my shoulder and said, Good, my boy, you have done well to come and see your poor teacher. I am reduced to a sad state, as you see, my dear Enrico. And how fares the school? How are your comrades getting along? All well, huh? Even without me. You do very well without your old master, do you not? I was on the point of saying no, but he interrupted me. Come, come, I know that you do not hate me. And he heaved a sigh. I glanced at some photographs fastened to the wall. Do you see, he said to me, all of them are of boys who gave me their photographs more than twenty years ago. They were good boys. These are my souvenirs. When I die, my last glance will be at them, at those roughish urchins among whom my life has been passed. You will give me your portrait also, will you not, when you have finished the elementary course? Then he took an orange from his nightstand and put it in my hand. I have nothing else to give you, he said. It is the gift of a sick man. 
I looked at it, and my heart was heavy. Listen to me, he began again. I hope to get over this. But if I should not recover, see that you strengthen yourself in arithmetic, which is your weak point. Make an effort. It is merely a question of a first effort, because sometimes there is no lack of aptitude. There is merely an absence of a fixed purpose or stability, as it is called. But in the meantime, he was breathing hard, and it was evident that he was suffering. I am feverish, he sighed. I am half gone. I beg of you, therefore, to apply yourself to arithmetic, to problems. If you don't succeed at first, rest a little and begin afresh, and press forward, but quietly, without fagging yourself, without straining your mind. Go, my respects to your mamma, and do not mount these stairs again. We shall see each other again in school, and if we do not, you must now and then call to mind your master of the third grade who was fond of you. I felt like weeping at these words. Bend down your head, he said. I bent my head to his pillow. He kissed my hair. Then he said to me, Go, and turned his face to the wall. I flew down the stairs, for I longed to embrace my mother. The Street, Saturday, 25th. I was watching you from the window this afternoon, when you were on your way home from the master's. You ran against a woman. Take more heed to your manner of walking in the street. There are duties to be fulfilled even there. If you keep your steps and gestures within bounds in a private house, why should you not do the same in the street, which is everybody's house? Remember this, Enrico. Every time that you meet a feeble old man, a poor person, a woman with a child in her arms, a cripple with his crutches, a man bending beneath a burden, a family dressed in mourning, make way for them respectfully. We must respect age, misery, maternal love, infirmity, labor, death. You see a person on the point of being run down by a vehicle, drag him away, if it is a child. Warn him, if he is a man. Always ask what else the child who is crying all alone. Pick up the aged man's cane when he lets it fall. If two boys are fighting, separate them. If it is two men, go away. Do not look on a scene of brutal violence, which offends and hardens the heart. And when a man passes, bound, and walking between a couple of policemen, do not add your curiosity to the cruel curiosity of the crowd. He may be innocent. Cease to talk with your companion and to smile when you meet a hospital litter, which is perhaps bearing a dying person or a funeral procession, for one may issue from your own home on the morrow. Look with reference upon all boys from the asylums who walk two and two, the blind, the dumb, those afflicted with the rickets, orphans, abandoned children, reflect that it is misfortune and human charity which is passing by. Always pretend not to notice anyone who has a repulsive or laughter-provoking deformity. Always extinguish every match that you find in your path, for it may cost someone his life. Please answer courteously a passerby who asks you the way. Do not look at anyone and laugh. Do not run without necessity. Do not shout. Respect the street. The education of a people is judged first of all by its behavior on the street. Where you find offenses in the streets, you will find offenses in the houses. And study the streets. Study the city in which you live. If you were to be hurled away from it tomorrow, you would be glad to have it clearly present in your memory, to be able to transverse it all again in memory. It is your own city and your little country, that which has been for so many years your world, where you took your first steps at your mother's side, where you experienced your first emotions, opened your mind to its first ideas, found your first friends. It has been a mother to you. It has taught you, loved you, protected you. Study it in its streets and in its people and love it.
and when you hear it insulted, defend it. Your Father. End of section 12. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas.